Thank you so much, Alexandra Botez. We have here today at our Girls Club room. Um, thanks, Alexandra, for joining us. I'm really happy to be here, Jen. Thanks for having me. And so today you're going to talk to us a little bit about the famous Botez Gambit. Can you explain what that means and then, you know, show us a couple of examples? For sure. So as you guys know, I have been uh, chess streaming full time and I often play rapid time controls like Blitz or Bullet. And I had this weird tendency to unfortunately give up my queen for not too much compensation. So I ended up joking that giving up a queen is a Botas Gambit. Today I wanted to mix it up a little bit and show some games where queen sacrifices were actually the right move to do. So I prepared a couple examples, um, two or three depending on how many we get through today. So I thought it would be fun to start off with something a little bit more tactical. So I have this position set up and here, as we can tell, White's King is already in a little bit of trouble, but at the same time, it looks like the Black Queen on H2 might be getting trapped at some point. After Rook H1, we're going to have to be really careful. We can play Queen G2 in the short term, but Black still needs to make sure that we're able to convert this short term advantage into a long term one and that we don't let White run away from here. So Black's last move was knight before, putting pressure on the c2 knight here, and White replied with the move rook h1, already starting the queen threat. So here, I'm just gonna pause for a second. Maybe we can make a poll and have some, some move suggestions, although maybe that's gonna give away the brilliancy of the move here. So one option Black might have would be to take on h1, move queen g2, or, and here's where we would pause, or, or here's where we can pause the, the, the game and I'll let you guys have a chance to try to figure it out. The move was actually rook takes f4. This was yeah. a super beautiful find. So before the rook on f1 was helping support the f4 square. And white continued with rook takes h2. But another important question would have been why couldn't white play knight takes f4 here? And the problem with knight takes f4 would be knight takes c2 with check. So we can go back a little bit. And actually, that's why rook h1 was a mistake instead of just moving the bishop back to b1 so that threat wouldn't be possible. But white did blunder, played rook h1, rook takes f4. So since black couldn't continue with knight takes f4, um, he continued instead with rook takes h2 here. So this is still a pretty tricky position. We gave up a queen. We shouldn't be giving up a queen unless we've calculated through. So this is, as I mentioned, a puzzle to get us started here. Black continued with rook f3. So the white king only has one option of where to go here, king d4. And here, this would be another great moment to pause because we have the king in the center of the board, but it seems like we're almost out of checks. We have to be very careful here. So what you should do in a position like this is come up with some candidate moves. Um, maybe you're thinking about bishop g7 check. Maybe you're also considering c5. Maybe you're also thinking knight c2, which isn't a good move. But often when you think of candidate moves, you're thinking about captures and checks as moves that you want to consider here. Maybe you're also considering moving the rook from f3 so that you could place your knight there. Instead, Bishop g7 was the move that Black decided to continue with. The bishop was under attack, so bishop g7 is creating a discovery attack on the king on d4. The king on d4 is really desperately trying to create some kind of escape square. If we look at the board here, there's nowhere the king can currently go to. So first a4 was made. The escape square is coming soon, not right away. White thought they were going to be okay for a while. c5 check. D takes C6 is the only move to continue with en passant. Black took with the pawn, and you might be asking, okay, well, why, why didn't we take with the knight here? Um, if we take with the knight, then we're going to lose control of one of the squares. So we lose control of D5 here. If we take with the other knight, then we're losing control of C4. And actually, taking with the pawn is still controlling D5, still controlling C5. So the king is in of the center of the board and has nowhere to go. Next, bishop d3 was an attempt. At this point, white was getting a little bit desperate, so willing to sacrifice pieces just to get the king to c3. Knight takes d3, king c4, 
Finally, White was able to remove the knight and uh, that way freed up the c4 square. Black is still behind on, on uh, peace material here. So it was okay for White to sacrifice a little bit. I mean, the goal was just to try and survive here. d5 check, e takes d5, c takes d5. The king has to go to b5, there's no other option. Rook b8 check, forcing the king onto a5. At this point, you guys can also try to take a little second and, and see if you can figure out the move here. Knight c6, check. And after king a6, I mean, I think white actually resigned here, but then we would have had the beautiful knight before mate. So this was obviously a very long checkmate. Very beautiful. It's one of those games that if you play, you're just going to feel so satisfied that you were able to have it on the board. Um, but I'm going to go quickly back to the starting position here. So the key behind this was noticing that, hey, our queen is going to be trapped. Are there any tactics we can try to do here? Um, the position here would actually be pretty level. We don't have to go into detail now. Um, I also have the PGNs and you guys can dig a little deeper if you want. But knight b4 is putting pressure on the c2 bishop. It would have been much trickier if white would have removed it, but it was a good find. After rook takes h1, you just realize that even if you're losing your queen, you get enough compensation because at the end of the day, king safety is more important than anything. And if you have enough active pieces, which black did, black actually used almost all of the pieces other than the a1, a8 rook for the attack, then sometimes you can have a very nice combination like this. That's a stunning example. I love it. Yeah, I thought this was, this was a really fun one as well. Um, but th this was more for more to please the eyes. I also have a game that's a little bit more positional. So um, I can set up that one next as well. We could take a look at part of it. That'd be great. Yeah. So this one's from 2019. And it's with uh, Ali Reza Faruja as white. So one of the fastest, one of the best juniors in the world. A lot of people think that he's going to be able to challenge for the world championship in the future. Here we have Faruja with the white pieces. He's playing against a very strong Indian grandmaster who was uh, over 2,600 at his peak. And um, Murali just played queen a5. So this was already a king's Indian. Faruja played a few sidelines here, but it wasn't a move that has never been played before. It's pretty intuitive queen a5. We're putting pressure to pin the knight to the king. We still have the long dark square diagonal here. So it's an idea you would see pretty commonly in the King's Indian. The threat for black here being knight takes e4, that would be a free pawn because the knight can't take back, it is pinned, it's in trouble. So white played knight d2. Knight d2 is both stopping the pin as well as protecting the pawn on e4. It also plays into a pretty common theme in um, playing the this structure as white when you wanna play f3 at some point if you ever need to defend or even just going for f4, a four pawn attack here. Very normal move. And here, black continued with c takes d4, knight b3, attacking the queen here. And the most intuitive move would probably be to just play queen c7. After queen c7, you can have a move like knight takes d4, you can play b6, you can continue to develop here. And this is a very ki normal king's Indian looking position. Instead, Black decided to play a little bit more on the wild side and moved queen takes c3, sacrificing a queen for a knight here. Of course, the bishop under on e3 is still under attack, so white black is actually going to get two minor pieces for a queen, so it's almost as if you're down a minor piece in terms of your material balance here. Check, and white had to take back with the c pawn. Black took the bishop on e3, and here Ali Reza decided to play f3 and ignore the pawn. If we would have seen f takes e3 here, white would have had a really bad pawn structure. And that really leads more into the beautiful positional understanding that uh, Murali had. So he sacrificed a piece, not for a tactical combination, which is what you usually see, but for 
a very interesting positional imbalance. So here, there's a lot of weak squares for white. There's the e5 square, there's the c5 square. Obviously, you have these very ugly double pawns. And even if you don't have the ugly double pawns and you have the position that continued with f3 here, black has no weaknesses. All of the pawns are very solid here. We have the bishop pair. White has a terrible light squared bishop. It's just caved in by all of the pawns. And if you look at computer analysis, it still gives a slight advantage for white, but less than um, one pawn's worth. So it wasn't even the engine line to take on c3. But from a human level of understanding here, black's plan is so much easier because you're playing in terms of the the square weaknesses. We traded our queen for a knight and a dark square bishop, so all of a sudden the dark square bishops by the king side are pretty weak, as well as e5, c5. White also has pretty straightforward ideas for developing. Um, at some point we want to put our bishop on the long diagonal if we can. We want our knight on e5, our knight on c5, and it's very difficult for white to actually find a way to break through here. So the position continued with knight h5, taking advantage of the dark squares, Queen c1, Perugia wanted to win back the pawn, and this was a much better way to do it than what he had done, or than if he would have played f takes c3, which would have ruined his pawn structure. Morali, of course, still a fighter. He sacrificed his queen, but he's not interested in sacrificing all of his pieces. So he played bishop h6 here to defend it, and Perugia played g4. He's up a queen, he feels like he can push his pawns a little bit, and for sure if he was going to be able to open the position, that's when um, the queen would be the piece that is stronger than the two minor pieces. Knight f5, um, knight g3, bishop f4, also an option, but knight f4 is a good move that is still taking advantage of the dark squares here. And what you notice here is that it's very difficult for white to get any kind of play. The king is in the center of the board, you know, moves like h4, h5, black just stays closed up here. Black could even play something like g5 and bishop g7. These pawns are super weak, um, and white is underdeveloped as well here. So Ferruja tried to play king d1 here. Um, he was trying to be protective to, so that he could develop his bishop at some point and not fall for d3. I think he also realized he couldn't castle, so he's trying to get his king to a safer square, potentially c2. Knight e6. Black was just protecting the pawn again. Um, this way, the queen uh, would be able to take otherwise because there was also no more discovery attacks. King c2, knight c6, black just continues the development here. h4, bishop f4, placing this, the bishop on another dark square weakness here. And as you can notice, if you push h5, you have g5, and the position is just completely closed up. So this was a very nice queen sacrifice for two minor pieces that black did end up winning through quite a nice positional grind. Beautiful. Like I've never seen that one before. Thank you so much for showing it to us, Alexandra. I love this example. I'm going to have to steal it. Yeah, it's a great one. I mean, it was such a beautiful game. You can't not pick this when you're talking about the Botez Gambit. Next time we got to see a really great example of your Botez Gambit, because I know that you actually have some, some, some that clearly win the game, right? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll find some that win the game. There was one actually recently, so I'll, I'll keep that in mind, other than just stealing from, you know, the, the best players there. No, no, that's great. That's fantastic. I mean, these examples are so awesome.